So I just want to talk a little bit about what we're all experiencing. Yes, she's done great work. <clears throat> what we're all experiencing together uh, with this corporate-led uh, globalization. And I think it's important for us to have this conversation because in my country, people say, well, what's wrong with a trade agreement with Europe? Because Europe is so wonderful. They've got better standards than the United States. Like, we were totally opposed to the free trade agreements with the United States. There was one before NAFTA. And actually, Canada and the United States formed the first free trade agreement in the world in 1989. I apologize to you for that. Um, and then it became NAFTA, and that became the model. But a lot of Canadians say, but Europe is different than the United States. The standards are higher, so that's good. And I know that in Europe, you either think Canada doesn't matter, <laughs> let's be honest, or you think that we're also a very wonderful, progressive country. And I have to tell you, we're not anymore. And there are many things in Europe that are not progressive anymore either. And we all have to start having a different kind of dialogue about this. In all of our countries, the United States, Canada, and all of the, and the European Union, we have gone after Social Security. In here, as you know, it's largely under the banner of austerity. In all of our countries, they've deregulated uh, in the environment. It's more recent here with uh, Jürgen um, bringing in this whole deregulation program to be, you know, smart regulations to reduce administrative burdens on business. You're going to find the same kind of discipline on uh, the environment that we've experienced in other countries. The United States went through this more when George Bush was president. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. of Waterkeepers wrote a book which at the end of the George Bush years, and he said that the Bush administration had gutted 400 environmental laws or regulations. And I saw Robert Kennedy last year, and I said to him, how many of those did Obama reintroduce? And he said, none. My country, I cannot begin to tell you how terrible our Prime Minister is. Prime Minister Harper, we're the only country in the world that ratified the Kyoto Accord, and then our government, this, when this government came into power, they pulled us out of the Kyoto Accord. They have absolutely gutted our freshwater laws. 99% of all our lakes and rivers are totally unprotected by any federal legislation whatsoever. So we have downgraded the environment in all, and or you're in the process of downgrading environmental regulation here in Europe. We've also seen the privatization of essential services like postal services and water services. And in both the United States and Canada, you should know this, there are new rules that if municipalities want to invest in infrastructure for new water systems, they have to, and get federal funding, they have to go to a public-private partnership. And of course, once you've done that, if you've got, you're in an, an investment agreement with big water companies, they can say you can never go back. So it's, it's a really um, dangerous trend um, that we're seeing. And it's important to note that the issue of lack of access to water is not just in the global south anymore. Through the austerity programs, so-called austerity programs in Europe, people in Greece, thousands of people in Greece and Spain and Portugal and other, other countries of the European Union have, have actually had their water cut off. And you may or may not have read about the crisis in Detroit, Michigan, where a million people moved out of the city over the last decade. They call it white flight. They left African American, very poor people there. Um, they took their money with them. They took the jobs with them. And then they doubled the uh, rate of water to people because they didn't have enough tax base. And last year, they started cutting off the uh, ability or the, wa the water systems in people's homes. They were going into uh, thousands of homes every month and cutting the water off. We got the United Nations nations to send the special rapporteur on water and sanitation to embarrass them. But this is happening in Boston and Baltimore and other cities now. So this notion that people not having access to clean water is an issue of the global south, that's not true anymore. It's right here in, in the so-called first world. <clears throat> We're also seeing the privatization of foreign aid. Here in Europe, the European Network on Debt and Development just put out a report that said that the most, most of the recent European development funds have ended up either in tax havens or in the corporate head offices of northern corporations. 
really scary. In my country, it's even more blatant. Our government has actually changed the rules so that any aid and development money has to go to only to those groups that will work with our mining companies. We have the biggest and worst mining companies in the world. They, are, they have terrible human rights and environmental records in the global south, but our government has said if, you want, if you're a development agency like Oxfam or whatever, if you will not accept uh, working with our mining companies to promote them in the countries that where we're giving aid, you're not getting funded. And so it split the development community between those who won't take that money, it's dirty money, and those who did. And now they're working to promote our mining companies that are going in and destroying the environment, <clears throat> involved in horrible human rights abuses. And also they'll only give to countries that welcome our mining companies. So that, that's how fast it's changing. Um, so we don't. So I don't need to tell you guys in this audience about the state all of this has had in terms of creating a, a wealth gap in our world and a, a deeply dividing world of inequality between countries, but also within countries. But I just will give you one statistic that I think is stunning, and that is that in the year 2000 there were 111, 111 billionaires in the world. This year there are 1,826 billionaires in the world. I just <clears throat> think it tells you a story that corporate-led globalization is, as Jeffrey Sachs says, of the 1%, for the 1%, and by the 1%. Now, <clears throat> all of this gets locked in by trade agreements like NAFTA, like all the 3,000 bilateral agreements like CETA and like TTIP and eventually like the new one they're talking about on services called TISA. And these are really dangerous because what these agreements do is they place a constitutional corporate framework around what I just talked about and make it almost impossible to undo what has been done. So if a, if a new generation says we've tried deregulation and privatization and liberalization and we don't like it and we want to move back and we want to elect governments that aren't going to do that or are going to change these rules, they have no option but to, uh, to maintain this kind of structure. So it's a form of domestic law, uh, it's a form of treaty that overrides domestic law and you need to know that you actually have to go through a process of changing domestic laws in anticipation of these agreements. <clears throat> now, how do I know all this? Well, we've been living with NAFTA for 20 years. NAFTA was the first trade agreement in the world to have investor state, ISDS, where the corporation could bypass its own government and directly sue the government of another country if that government brings in any health or safety law, environmental, resource protection, whatever, any law that this company can prove has interrupted their right to profit. Um, and we have suffered in Canada over NAFTA. We were told a, a whole bunch of promises that were uh, absolute lies. The most important image for you to have about our country is that we used to look like a big egg with a big middle class and a very, fairly small group of wealthy and a fairly small group of poor, and now we look like uh, a pair with fewer and fewer holding top uh, power at the top, and our the differences between rich and poor have dramatically grown in 20 years, and more and more of us falling out at the bottom. This is, this is We gutted our social security, and the first free trade agreement was made when Ronald Reagan was president. So you can imagine what we were afraid of, and what we were afraid of came true. Uh, CEOs in our country, their, their profits have soared, and of course many, many, many companies just took their manufacturing offshore. Uh, but ordinary families, ordinary people have absolutely suffered. Their incomes are basically what they were in the 1980s, except now they have record debt that they never had before. So we have experienced what the, what the promises were, and we've experienced the lies, and we've experienced investor state. We are the most challenged country in terms of investor state challenges. There are 35 challenges that we've either had or before us now, totaling at the moment 2.6 billion US dollars against Canadian uh, laws, against the Canadian government for laws or practices in Canada. And these are all by American corporations protected by NAFTA. Um, there are so many of them, but I'll just give you a few examples. One is over a moratorium the province of Quebec brought in on fracking. 
Uh, one is, uh, again, Quebec brought in a ban on um, pesticides, lawn pesticides. The American company that was selling this stuff in Canada is suing for millions of dollars. An oil company, ExxonMobil, just won a whole bunch of money from a NAFTA challenge because the province of Newfoundland, where they were operating, had the nerve to say, would you please put some money into research and development and help us build a local economy? You're not allowed to do that. And so they went to court uh, on after challenge a, a, a tribunal, and they won. Um, a company called Eli Lilly, which is a big uh, US a drug manufacturer operating in Canada, wanted to extend its patent. Its patent was 20 years, it was up. So they put it into a new pill and they said it's a new patent and the government in Canada said no it's not. So they went to court three time, three levels including the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said go away, your patent's finished, right? They're challenging for 500 million US dollars and they're probably going to win. Now this is not only in Canadian law that they're challenging, they're challenging the decision of our courts. And our courts are a good courts. I mean, this is a mature court system and, and interpreting a law that Canadians wanted and it doesn't matter to these companies. And you can, you can see by this that these companies come back again and again and again. <clears throat> there was another one that you should know about that I think is the most important of them all because it sets a very bad precedent. A pulp and paper company from the United States was operating again in Newfoundland for decades. They went bankrupt, which means that they didn't want to pay their debt, so they just con con reconfigured under a new name. And they left. They left the jobs, they left the pensions unpaid, and then they turned around and they said to the Canadian government, we want compensation for the water rights we left behind. The province of Newfoundland said, that's our water. You have the right to use it when you're creating jobs here. And they said, no, it's our water. And our government, without even going to an after panel, gave them $130 million. Now, the dangerous thing, now stop and think about this. What this means is that a foreign corporation protected by investor state agreement can claim to own the resource in another country that it needed to produce what it produces. So it could be forests, it could be soil, it could be water, it could be minerals, it could be anything they need to, to produce what they used. Think of that in terms of land grabs and the international investors coming into Africa and other places a able to say, not only do I have a 40 or 50 year lease to use this land and displace all these people, but we actually can claim to own the land and the water. This is a very bad new precedent. <clears throat> and by the way, the, you know that Obama is going to likely veto the Trans-Canada pipeline, the Keystone pipeline, bringing the most awful, horrible energy filled with uh, liquid benzene and liquid chemicals through a pipeline over the Ogallala Aquifer insanity. He's going to say no. The Canadian company is likely to challenge through NAFTA. So, you know, we, and we kind of, all of us in the movement in North America kind of hope they do because the United States never loses any of these challenges. And we want them to have a feeling of what it's like to be on the losing end, which we've had. So it's really important that we understand what we're dealing with here when we look at CETA and TTIP. And I want to make a plea to you, because a lot of you talk about TTIP. You need to understand that TTIP and CETA are the same thing. If you manage to get investor state kept out of TTIP, but it's in CETA, you may as well have it in TTIP, because all an American company has to do is register in Canada and then they can sue through Canada. And most of the corporations, we're a branch plant economy, so most of the cor American corporations are already registered in Canada. Monsanto and all the big energy companies, they're all in Canada. So it's really important when you think about TTIP that you remember that the CETA agreement is much more advanced and if it happens, you're going to lose a lot around, we're all going to lose a lot around um, what this means. So if CETA and or TTIP has investor state in it, that's not just our concerns about the big water companies in Europe or the big pharmaceutical companies in Europe suing us, they, it will go the other way. So no, big North American energy companies will have the right to challenge fracking bans, that kind of thing. Big North American um, uh, or, or um, uh, agriculture companies like Monsanto will have the right to challenge 
uh, restrictions on GMOs and, and animal welfare and animal standards and so on because they're lower in North America than they are here. Um, and I know that the governments are saying, oh, we're going to make it airtight, that it's going to be all safe, that any, uh, any jurisdiction can say that they want to be GMO free, but I promise you, they will not allow that to stand. I mean, they, they are all on record as saying this agreement, this TTIP, is to be used to bring down the different standards in Europe, and they'll find ways to do it. Um, Canadian mining companies have horrible operations in Greece, in Romania. These companies will have the right to sue uh, these countries if they start saying we're going to limit the amount of size of your growth or the amount of water you're allowed to use or whatever. So this is going to be the, 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 the challenge Challenges are going to be basically that big European corporations are going to be able to challenge our higher stand standards in Canada and the United States and vice versa. And it's a race to the bottom. It is not about North America versus Europe. It's about big corporations on both sides of the border and the 1% and the on, on all sides of the ocean uh, wanting to take down these standards. And I want to say very clearly that you must not believe the promise of a kinder, gentler, ISDS in in TTIP and uh, and in CETA. That's what the that's what uh, Chancellor Merkel basically said the other day. That's not the case. The the two agreements are very similar, but the one in TTIP and CETA is worse for two reasons. One is that regulatory convergence is built right into CETA and TTIP, and it is not built into NAFTA. There was a separate process in NAFTA to try to get regulatory convergence, but it's not written into the agreement in the way that it's written in TTIP and CETA. And they're going to set up a semi-private system with technocrats and bureaucrats and private uh, advisors, and any company can can ask to go through that process to make sure that any regulation, future or existing in Europe, is not a, a hindrance, a barrier to their trade. And it's a very important uh, part of this agreement. They're also, it's TTIP and, and uh, CETA also give investors more right to challenge domestic financial regulations and restrictions. So I would argue that the ISDS in T, C, T, um, TTIP and CETA are worse than they are in NAFTA, and they're horrible in NAFTA. So I'm going to not talk for much longer because I want to talk with you rather than at you, but what I want to say, um, a couple of things in closing. One of them is that we cannot fight this by ourselves. We're in an awkward position in Canada that we have a majority government that is just absolutely committed to this kind of vision, and they don't put a soft face on it. They just basically, well, they call people like me enemies of Canada and terrorists. Um, that's what our prime minister <clears throat> says outright about environmentalists, people who are fighting the pipelines. We're terrorists. I, 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 you know, it's just appalling if you think of it. So we, uh, we, we have an election in October, and we're hoping that we will not have this government and we'll have some openings. But at the moment, we don't um, have any openings in our country. Our progressive party, uh, the NDP, New Democratic Party, which would be like the Social Democrats and the Greens, they won't take a position at the moment because they don't want to be labeled anti-trade. Anti driving me crazy. And Obama in the United States, who you might remember when he was first running for president, talked very openly about the problems with trade and particularly NAFTA. And he said he would have a whole process whereby uh, they did consultation on these trade agreements and they would have a different assessment based on a whole different set of values. It was just, he just, they were just empty words. Uh, President Obama drank the Kool-Aid, and he's totally 100% behind this agreement, behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and so on. So it's, we don't have a lot of openings in terms of politics. There's the fast track um, system that Shefali will talk about, but, the, but in terms of changing Obama's mind, that's not going to happen either. So at the moment, you are, oh, you are Obi-Wan, you know, the, you are, you're our great hope um, here in Europe and particularly in Germany, although I know there's concerns in Austria and France. I saw a terrific statement today with a whole bunch of 
uh, political leaders in France uh, signing a, a strong statement against ISDS. But it's very, very important that we work together because we can, if we do this right, we can work together and support each other, share information, and um, stop this process. Cross-border co collaboration is extraordinarily important, and we have used this in past fights like this, we were not able to stop NAFTA from being passed in my country because the government that introduced it, everybody bumped, bumped, threw them out, but the government that replaced them, the Liberals, who had promised they wouldn't pass NAFTA without six fundamental changes, turned around and, and ratified it without one change. And I remember when the Prime Minister of the time did that, he wouldn't look at the camera. I can remember that. It was like, I know I'm lying so badly here, breaking so many promises. So even though two-thirds of Canadians were against NAFTA, we got NAFTA. But when they wanted to extend NAFTA to the other countries of the Americas, South America, it was called the Free Trade Area of the Americas, we shared our, our experience with, the, with these agreements, and we were able to stop the expansion of the, free, of the free trade area of the Americas. And in the late 1990s, we stopped something called the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, and it was an OECD proposal that would have given this investor state rights to all of the OECD countries. It was, it snuck up on us, I heard about it, I went to the government, our government at the time, and I said, do you know about this? And they said, oh, you and your conspiracy theories, right? That's just a conspiracy theory. When I hear about a conspiracy theory, I think about two cows on a hill, and one of them's always reading something, and the other one says, why don't you relax? You're always reading <laughs> conspiracy stuff. And this time, the other cow says, yeah, but I'm reading something called what, where beef really comes from. You know, it's just like, <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, Okay, so I, the, the conspiracy turned out to be true. They were almost 90% through the MAI when we got it in a brown paper bag and we shared it with Lori Wallach in, in the US and our counterparts here in Europe and we just exploded it everywhere and we built a movement and we won. Germany was the first country to pull out, France pulled out, Canada pulled out and it collapsed. And I remember after the battle in Seattle in uh, the WTO, uh, the 1999, when we had all the crazy tear gas and stuff, the, the, the Pentagon hired the Rand Corporation in the United States to do a study on who were these people, like where did we come from, right? And it, it, it is a riot, you have to read this thing. What they said was, well, we, they're like mosquitoes. We can't find their leadership, they're everywhere and they sting. And we can't stop them, you know? It was like, they, we'll spray them a bit with tear gas and stuff, but they keep coming back. It, it's a very funny analysis. So I always think about us as, as a bunch of little stinging uh, mosquitoes. So we have a lot of work cut out and we need to do this work together. And I just wanna end with um, uh, one more message of hope. And that is that, Barbara, you kindly referred to the uh, fight for the human right to water. When we introduced, it just was a confluence of marvelous things. Uh, a man named Father Miguel Descado Brockman from Nicaragua, a, a theologian, revolutionary theologian priest, um, was named president that year, the year 2009-10 of the General Assembly. So it's only a one-year term. And he got a hold of me right away and he said, I want to make water crucial to my year here. I want to, I want to do this, right? I want to get water recognized as a human right. And the Bolivian ambassador was named Pablo Solo and he had introduced me to President Evo Morales of Bolivia before Evo Morales was president. And Evo Morales said to me, if I ever become president, I am promising you that we will help you get the human right to water and sanitation passed. So Father Miguel and myself and Pablo Solo put together a little team and we were up against such opposition. I have to say Germany was terrific. Your country was very supportive, but most were not. The United States was opposed. My government led the opposition. All the big water companies were against it. The World Bank was against it. The World Water Council was against it. And countries kept saying, you really have to study it some more. We need to study some more how many children are dying and why. You know, well, let's study it some more. And Pablo said, no, we're just going to do this. So he put a resolution to the General Assembly on July 28, 2010. 
And he just, and he wouldn't change it. He, they kept saying, well, you've got, oh, it's too strong. It's just too direct. You've got to take out sanitation because it's too expensive. And he said, I would rather lose a bad resolution. Uh, uh, yeah, or I'd rather lose a good, re good resolution than win a bad resolution. I'm going to put it to the General Assembly, and let's see who has the nerve to vote against the human right to water. So he got up and he gave one of the most beautiful speeches. There was a new study that had just come out on child deaths in the global south, and he said, it's a World Health Organization study that said every three and a half seconds a, a child dies of waterborne disease in the global south, and then he held up three fingers like this and then kind of a half a finger, right? And the whole place just went silent. And I was standing up on the, in the balcony with my husband, Andrew, and some of the staff. And my staff were in tears because we were sure we were going to lose. I was just in, sure because it was going to go to a vote. And I was saying, don't you worry. We're gonna, we'll be back in five years or 10 years. We won't give up. We'll keep fighting. But, and it's so exciting that we're here. I was trying to prepare them for this loss, right? So when they vote at the General Assembly, they stay in their seats. And it all goes up on a great big electronic board at the front. So they voted, and immediately we were able to see 122 countries voted in favor. Not one country voted against. In fact, they, 41 countries abstained, including the United States and Canada. Germany, of course, supported it. Um, and the place erupted in cheers. And I'll never forget uh, Ambassador Solnom from Bolivia was in the balcony with us. And he was standing there just smiling, you know, with his arms crossed. And one after another, the ambassadors from the country turned and yelled at him. And you, may, you forced us to do this before we were ready. And I will always remember the, in English, we call it a shit-eating grin. You know, he was standing there with like saying, what part of we just won and you didn't, do you not understand? And it was a, a sweet moment. And since then, a whole number of countries have revised their constitution, have come up with plans. It has, of course, it hasn't made everything better overnight. And I mean, the world outlawed torture in 1948 and it still exists, but as a human family, we came together and we said, no child should have to die because their parents cannot afford water. And you know nobody should have to go put their children to bed at night without clean sanitation. No girl should have to not be able to go to school because there's no facilities and she has to walk with her mother all those kilometers every day. This is what the, the global community of humans came together and said and we took a, a step forward. So I think these trade agreements are the dying gasp of a regime that's dying. The world cannot sustain what's happening here. We cannot sustain, it's not just the inequality. I mean, don't get me started on the stats on water. We are a planet running out of clean water. It's not drought in California, they're running out of water. It's not drought in China. Half the rivers in China are gone since 1990, you know? We can't keep having more and more stuff and more and more corporate power and more and more corporate grab of what is the common good, what is the public trust. So I thank you for this tonight, and I look forward to a discussion with you. And more importantly, I look forward to building this relationship and this alliance across the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean um, to not only stop CETA and TTIP, but to bring in a whole new kind of regime, because we really do need a revolution in our economic systems as well. Thank you very much. Dankeschön.